Hello, my name's Bev and I'm the author of the book Please Eat, A Mother's Struggle to Free Her Teenage Son from Anorexia, which describes our family's battle with the deadly eating disorder, anorexia nervosa, which my teenage son Ben developed back in 2009. Welcome to chapter 10, which is called Admiring Cakes. A few weeks before Christmas, the three of us do some last-minute Christmas shopping in Manchester's Trafford Centre. The demon is thankfully absent and Ben is back to his normal self, or at least the normal self we're getting used to. The Ben that automatically goes for the diet or low-calorie option when it comes to choosing a take-out lunch from Boots or Marks and Spencer. Ben, you're not on a diet, I want to yell. But we manage to shop, have a laugh and eat. We're almost like any other family, getting excited by all the festive lights and sparkle. A famous celebrity is signing his latest book and the place is milling with teenage girls and their mothers. I watch them form a long queue outside the bookstore. My eyes move along the line. Here we have a full range of physiques, from the big to the positively skinny. Too skinny, I worry. I can't be bothered to cook tonight, I say as we leave, exhausted, late in the afternoon. I suggest we go to Pizza Express. Risky, I know, but I'm completely shopped out. So we do. And we eat pizzas just like any other family. No one would ever guess there's anything amiss. Unless, of course, they could see into my mind, which, as ever, is coiled up like a spring, ready for the demon to strike. So far, the demon has left us alone in public. So far. Ben orders a pizza. So far, so good. And he eats it. So far, even better. Then the waitress asks if we'd like to see the dessert menu. I wait for Ben to decline, but to my surprise, he orders a chocolate fudge sundae and proceeds to eat every bit. I watch with astonishment as he spoons the sticky, sickly chocolate toffee concoction into his mouth. I wonder what's going on inside his head. At this stage, I wanted to prove I could conquer the illness without treatment, he tells me years later. But oh my God, did the anorexia beat me up afterwards for eating that huge pizza and pudding. It's Ben's pre-birthday party and sleepover, a week before Christmas, just like last year. Only it isn't just like last year. The usual suspects are there but this time they're un unusually quiet. I take a peek into Ben's bedroom where the boys are silently playing a computer game. Is it my imagination or could you cut the atmosphere with a knife? One boy complains of feeling unwell, so his mum drives over to pick him up. At bedtime, it's the first time in the history of Ben's sleepovers that I haven't had to bash on the door and tell them to be quiet. The house is completely silent. Just after midnight, a loud crash wakes us with a start. Paul and I rush onto the landing and Ben is charging down the two flights of stairs, howling like a wounded animal and hurtling towards the living room door. We fly downstairs. He's in a terrible state, weeping and almost hyperventilating. Ben, stop it, Paul shouts, grabbing Ben's fists, which he's thumping against the living room door. It turns out that one of his friends was irritating him, and Ben flipped. Meanwhile, all is unnaturally silent upstairs. The next morning, a subdued group of boys makes their way downstairs for breakfast, making polite conversation, trying to pretend that the previous night didn't happen. It's a relief when their parents collect them. I can sense the mums and dads looking critically at Ben. 
and I can't resist looking at their sons as they come downstairs. Big, burly boys, followed by a skinny, waif-like Ben. It's a long time since the parents have seen Ben, and I can't help wondering what they're thinking. On the Sunday before Christmas, we go to a carol service. An abandoned church is being brought back to life, and this is the first service that's been held there for decades. Everyone has been told to wrap up warm because there's no heating in the semi-derelict building and it's snowing heavily outside. There is no organ, just a gaping hole where it used to be, cordoned off with some hazard tape. Plaster is peeling off the damp walls and some of the stained glass has been vandalised. There's no lighting in the dark interior, just a few twinkling fairy lights which someone has managed to rig up as well as dozens of candles. It is freezing, so cold you can see your breath. Colder than anyone, I suspect, is Ben, wrapped up in layer upon layer of clothing, his nose red and his skin pale, almost translucent in the candlelight. I'm aware of him staring at the gap where the long-removed altar once stood, a desperate look on his face. As the choir sings carols, I can see a tear, tears welling up in his eyes, and after the service, he walks over to a table by the old stone font and picks up some leaflets and a St Mark's Gospel. I can almost physically feel him reaching out for help. I fantasise about a bolt of heavenly healing streaking through the vaulted gothic roof and into Ben's soul. But of course nothing happens. And we leave the atmospheric church without anyone being any the wiser that our son so desperately needs help. <clears throat> Cooking is a risky business, especially with Christmas drawing closer. But Ben can't keep out of the kitchen. There he is, apron on, ready to cook another healthy version of something or other. It only takes one thing to go wrong and zap, the demon swoops in. Earlier that afternoon, I'd heard a telltale crash coming from the kitchen, accompanied by an almost primeval howl of no, followed by shit, shit, shit. Then the sound of something being thrown or slammed onto the work surface. Ben stamped his feet with an almighty force before fleeing upstairs yelling. The fat free cake he'd been baking was too dry. My cooking has to be perfect too. I feel as if I'm appearing on a hellish version of TV's MasterChef. If I fail to make the grade, even by a minuscule bit, the demon will blow a fuse. By Christmas, I've got to the stage where I'm in mortal dread of setting it off. The trouble is the demon can spot the kind of imperfection that's undetectable to the naked eye. So I never know whether I've slipped up until it's too late. Too hot, too cold, too much, too dry, too soggy, too bland, too oily. Despite my better judgment, I let Ben make some ginger cookies to decorate the Christmas tree. Angels, stars, Christmas trees, holly leaves and Santas, each with satin red ribbon threaded through a hole made by a drinking straw. Predictably, he sets about making a healthy version, eliminating all the fat and reducing the sugar content. Unusually, he doesn't fly off the handle when, surprise, surprise, the cookies are tasteless and rock hard. Still, at least they look festive, hanging on the Christmas tree with their pretty red ribbons. A couple of days before Christmas, and it's Ben's 16th birthday, we've been to the cinema with my sister, followed by a surprisingly angst-free curry. Alison has deliberately chosen a healthy Indian restaurant to appease the demon. Towards the end of the meal, the snow begins to fall thick and fast, and eventually the car gets stuck in a drift. We make our way back to the house on foot, trudging up the middle of the silent street, past house upon house of twinkling Christmas lights. 
Once home, Paul coaxes the embers in the grate back to life. We switch on the tree lights and I light some scented candles. For a brief moment, I'm transported into a magical Christmas wonderland of childhood memories. Santa leaving a stocking full of toys with some chocolate coins and an apple and orange in the toe. My dad reading Hans Christian Andersen's stories in front of the coal fire by candlelight. Ben's blank look jolts me back to the present. I just don't feel Christmassy, he says. Ben's mind is completely numb. It's as if he's been anaesthetized. To be honest, I couldn't give a damn about Christmas either. Me, who usually goes over the top with decorations covering every surface in the house, dozens of fairy lights and enough food and drink to feed an army. It's the first year I haven't sent any Christmas cards. I just don't feel like it. Thankfully, my sister has offered to cook Christmas dinner because, frankly, if it was left to me, I wouldn't bother. On Christmas Eve, I'm sitting on the sofa, thinking about parents everywhere who, at Christmas, want more than anything to get their little boy or little girl back, whether it's anorexia, drugs, runaways, gangs, crime, drinks, going off the rails, or worse. I watch Paul and Ben building a snow Santa outside the house. Our neighbours trot across the road to admire it, unaware of the trauma that's going on in our lives. Just moments later, we're going through another crisis as Ben explodes in the kitchen over some calorie or food issue. I can't remember what. But I do remember sobbing that I just want my little boy back over and over again while carols from kings washes over my head on the radio. Curiously, on Christmas Day, despite the worsening anorexia, Ben eats a full Christmas dinner without much complaint. The demon has given us another day off. Just one day, mind you. By Boxing Day, the demon is well and truly back. And the next day, when we go for a walk in the Derbyshire Peaks, Ben unnecessarily charges up and down the steep hill, then up and down again as if on a military training exercise, as the demon pushes him to exercise off the festive excesses. But to his credit, he orders a bean burger when we stop off at a cafe for lunch. Winter 2009-2010 is the winter of the big freeze, the year the lake in our local park freezes solid. Ben and I trudge through the snowy wooded gorge towards the frozen lake and the ruins of what was once a stately home. Our walk gives us the opportunity to talk. Talking like this is a little more successful than trying to talk at home. It's not so confrontational, yet I still feel as if I'm flogging a dead horse. No matter what I say, it falls on deaf ears. Ben is unable to see logic or reason. He will argue that black is white until he is blue in the face. Actually, looking at Ben standing shivering by a ruined stone archway, it really does look as if he's blue in the face. His illness means he feels the cold more than most people, so he's wrapped up warm against the freezing temperatures. But I'm painfully aware that beneath the chunky sweater, jacket, hat, scarf and gloves is an increasingly emaciated body. <clears throat> Yet he can't see this. Or can he? I'm not sure, because although he now admits that something is wrong, he still sees fat where there isn't any. Another aspect of his illness becomes starkly clear as we stop off at a cafe for a hot drink. Black coffee for Ben, naturally. There, in the display cabinet, are dozens of cakes and bakes. Chocolate fudge cake, carrot cake, millionaire's shortbread, coffee and walnut gatto. Ben is drawn to these like a magnet. Not to eat them, but to admire them, as you or I might admire works of art hanging in a gallery. A girl comes over to take his order, and gives him an odd look when he shakes his head but continues to stare. He moves to where I'm sitting. Mum, you have to see this cake. It's amazing. 
and attempts to drag me over to admire the display. I refuse. There we are, during the festive season, living in the Western world where food is abundantly available, almost obscenely so in this cafe full of cakes. Yet my son is starving himself, or rather the anorexia is starving him. Fortunately for the wild fowl on the lake, someone's broken a large section of ice so they can swim around, fighting for the chunks of bread being tossed into the water by young families. At least they're enjoying their food. Shortly after New Year, we resume our sessions with Karen. I stand in the kitchen talking to her on the phone. He's only been back at school a couple of days and already things are deteriorating. I tell her he's depressed, feels numb, doesn't want to talk to his friends and can't stop thinking about food. And he thinks he's getting fat. To be honest, I don't think I can cope with much more and I know Paul can't. I hate seeing my big burly husband breaking down in tears. Karen takes it seriously. Look, she says, if you like, I'll write to Cam's and ask if the, if Ben's referral can be speeded up. I remember she said she used to work for one of the Cam's teams in our city. But if he loses any more weight or starts to lose it quickly, then please promise me you'll get in touch with your GP again. Then, at the end of January, something unexpected happens which abruptly ends our sessions with Karen. That's the end of chapter 10. If you move to the end of this video, there'll be an in-video link which will take you to chapter 11, which is called CAMS. I look forward to seeing you there. Thank you for listening. It would also be really good if you could like this video and you can subscribe to my channel by clicking the subscribe button below. Oh, and don't forget to visit my blog you'll find the link below. You'll also find a link to my website where you can download PDFs of my blog for free.